We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. All right, well, this morning we were in the third week of our series, Journal Entries, which we kicked off as three weeks ago, and uh, what a great series it has been so far. And as we've been saying throughout the course of this series, you know, the, the name journal entries, it sounds a little bit boring until you hear the subtitle, which is learning from our greatest fears. And the whole idea is, is that if we can begin to learn to process our greatest fears through the filter of the Word of God, what we begin to learn is that His Word has the ultimate authority over my life. Not my feelings, not my failures, not my insecurities, None of that, which may, may cause fear in our heart, has the greatest authority in my life unless we allow it. The Word of God has the ultimate authority over our lives. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to go on this journey. What does it look like on a daily basis to lean into the Word of God, to lean into prayer, and to allow God to give us our greatest breakthroughs, even in spite of our greatest fears? So He wants to leverage our fears. And so we want to encourage you, if you've not began the process of journaling, that you would do so. And each and every morning, we've given you a framework over the past couple of weeks. And if you weren't here, I would encourage you to go back and to listen and, or watch the messages. You you can pick that up. If you need a journal, you can pick them up at Connection Point this morning. We have those available for you. But someone said to me last week, you know, I'm just having a really hard time of getting in the groove of it and, and really the discipline of it. And, and I've heard it said this, it takes 21 days to establish a habit. And so don't think about this, doing this for the rest of your life necessarily, but just think, okay, I can commit to three weeks of this each and every day for, for the next morning. We can all do that. And so what we'll find is, is that order begins to come to our private world, to our hearts. Our fear, again, doesn't have the authority over us. We learn the Word of God has the authority over our lives and over our experiences and over our, our fears. As we've seen in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7, God has not given us a spirit of what? Of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear. The middle section, you've been here all three weeks. Thank you very much. The rest of you, we got some catching up to do. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And what we find is if the heart isn't in order, then we're controlled by a spirit of fear, a literal spirit of fear, which is not what God wants for you. God wants you to live under the control and under the power and under the love and under the authority of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants for you. And so, this is what we're learning throughout the course of this series. Now, today as we dive in, as we've been talking about all kinds of different fears, we're going to be talking about a fear that has probably been one of my biggest fears since we started the church six years ago, and even before then, and a fear that every one of us can relate to. And that is a fear of uncertainty. A fear of uncertainty. So I want you to ask yourself the question right now, what is it that I'm right now fearing that's uncertain in my life? It could be your marriage. It could be your financial world. It could be the trip that you're about to take to Guatemala. You're not sure, okay, how are my kids gonna handle this? What is your greatest fear this morning? And I would encourage you, even as you take notes, because you're taking notes, right? If you're not, you should be. Even as you're taking notes, just to jot down somewhere, even if it's someone beside you, you don't want them to see it, you know, just kind of make a little note. This is my greatest fear right now in terms of being uncertain in life. What is your greatest uncertainty right now? Now, can I tell you that when we put our yes on the table to plant the point, okay, just over six years ago, um, one of the greatest fears and worries and uncertainties that I had from the very beginning is, Lord, we need a place to meet. If we're going to have church, we got to have a place to meet. And where is that going to be? Now, let me tell you the journey of, of, of arriving here at Monticello High School, because this seems a little bit irrelevant because you guys are sitting here. We've been here for six years. But know this, that there was a season where we weren't quite sure what this was going to look like, if we were even going to find anywhere to meet. And um, when we put our yes on the table to plant the point, it might March 9th of 2009, I wrote this in my prayer journal, one of my journals I shared with you all of those last week. But here's what I wrote. God is leading us to plant this church in Charlottesville, and we're excited about what he has in store. There are so many needs that I'm aware of, or you can insert the word uncertainties, so many uncertainties that I'm aware of, and many that I'm not even aware of. Okay, it was a season where when we were planting, every door that you opened, it was like there were 10 other doors you realized had to be opened. Have you ever been there in life? 
I mean, you open one door only to discover that there are 10 other doors that still you have questions. What's that going to look like? And so this was a season where there were a lot of those. We were praying about a timeline of when we were going to launch. We were praying for a worship leader. We were praying for financial support. We were praying, praying for a place to meet. Now, God told us to start this church on October 11th of 2009. Now, let me tell you, okay, it wasn't until just over a week before that we found out this would be the place that we would be worshiping, okay? I kid you not. We're praying over this, and here's what I write in my prayer journal. We learned this last week on September 30th that we would be having services here at Monticello High School. So you do the math. October, or no, excuse me, September 30th is when we found out we could meet here. October the 11th, we launched, okay? You talk about the 11th hour, the 11th hour. This was like a down to the moment God opened up this door of opportunity. Now again, we're sitting here six years later, an amazing facility, so we don't necessarily feel the crunch of that, but I can tell you that as I tell the story, the uncertainty of that season, it really comes back to me. And if I were to open up all of my journals over the past six years, I would tell you probably the word that occurs the most is, Lord, help me through this uncertainty that's in front of us. So what is your uncertainty this morning? Because we're going to learn how to deal with our uncertainties. What's your uncertainty? To do this, I want you to turn with me to probably a very well-known passage of Scripture that regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey, far from God, you're kind of exploring, you know, whatever the case is, you've probably at least heard about this story. And it's the book of Exodus chapter number 14. In Exodus chapter 14, what we're going to learn is we're going to see where God's people are facing a major uncertainty. And what I want to do is set this up by giving you a point for this morning, okay? I want you to write this down as your point for this morning as we dive into this idea of uncertainties. God uses obstacles of uncertainty as opportunities to show off for his glory and for our good, okay? So that I know you're with me, I want you to read that out loud together. Ready? God uses obstacles of uncertainty as opportunities to show off for his glory and for our good. Now leave that up there for just a moment so everybody can write that down, okay? God uses obstacles of uncertainty as opportunities to show off for his glory and for our good. What I found was with this school is that God put us in a position where when the door of opportunity did open, it was only one person that was gonna get the glory for it. And God said, that was me. And that's what we will find in our uncertainties. God will put us in a position where only he can get the glory for what it is that he's going to do. So in Exodus chapter 14, with all of that said, God's people have a big, big need. They need God to show up in a huge way. And beginning with verse number one, here's what the word says. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pi-Hiroth between Migdal and the sea. And you shall camp in front of Baal Zavon, opposite by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. So God says, I want you to do this because Pharaoh and his armies are going to look at them and say, they have no clue what they're doing. We feel that way sometimes, don't we? But God always has a plan. Verse four, thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and they did so. Now, here's what you have to understand about verses one through four. More or less, okay, God's people were home free. Okay, the journey they had traveled out of Egypt, literally, they had been led up to the edge of this desert. And they were about to cross this desert. And if they had crossed the desert, there was no way that the Egyptians could actually follow after them with their horses and with their chariots and with their army. It would have been impossible for them to take their entire you know, army through this sea because of the sand of the desert. It would have been impossible. And so God, God led his people right up to this point where it looks like this is the obvious answer. This is the obvious direction. You're home free. And in this moment, in the last moment, God tells his people, I want you now to turn south. And you're going to turn south, which makes no sense whatsoever. And what God is going to say is, I'm going to lead you into a very hard place, into a place of uncertainty. 
And as God leads them, he leads them down to essentially where Israel is trapped between a mountain range off to their west, between the sea on their, on their east, and between the Egyptian army. Now, why in the world would God do this? This makes no sense. If God's going to deliver his people like they had that, why would God have done that? This makes no sense if Israel is the center of the story. Are you with me? The uncertainty right now that you're facing, that I'm facing, this makes no sense if you and I are the center of the story. But I've got news for all of us this morning. We're not the center of the story of our lives. Life isn't about me. It's not about you. What this is about is about the glory of God. And a lot of times why our uncertainties become so painful is because we lose sight of where the focus has to be. It's very easy in our uncertainties to put ourselves in the middle of the story. It's very easy to become so overwhelmed and so burdened that we place ourselves in the middle. And it's then that we lose perspective, that we lose the sight, we lose the vision. But we're not meant to be the middle of our story. I want to read verse number four from the New Living Translation because what we see here is that God's telling his people, you're not the sinner, I'm the sinner. In verse number four, listen to the New Living Translation. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory. Say those words with me. In order to display my glory. Say it again. In order to display my glory. To who? Listen, through Pharaoh through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, so the Israelites camp there as they were told. You know what God is most concerned with right now in your story, in your uncertainty? He's concerned with you, yes. But do you know what ultimately God is consumed with? His glory and his renown. And I'm telling you this morning that the uncertainty that you're facing that there's a very good chance that God has led you into the uncertainty because God is going to show off in a great way in your life. And I, while I realize that doesn't necessarily bring emotional comfort to the moment, spiritually, it ought to put our heart on a brand new level as we realize that oftentimes in our most difficult seasons and places, God is about to do something huge. God is about to work a miracle. Now, here's our problem, is that we all love miracles, but none of us like to be in a position where a miracle is needed. We've removed all of the God room out of our lives, right? All of that room where only God could get the glory out of what's about to happen. We don't like that. So I want you to look at what happens here as we continue on. And, and, and we're going to drop down to verse number 10 in this story, okay? So down to verse number 10, what we're about to learn is, okay, th this is, they're trapped between this, this rock and the sea, this rock, this hard place in the sea. Verse 10, and as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. If you're writing your Bible, taking notes, underline those words, they became very frightened. And then they said to Moses, it is because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we can just serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in, in the wilderness. Now, here's what blows my mind about this story. Scripture tells us that God had been leading them literally with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Like they had that in front of them. If you and I were given that opportunity, to God to say, look, I'm going to lead you this clearly, we would take it, right? God, make it that obvious for us. It was so obvious for them where it was that God had led them. Yet their circumstances became so heavy that they crush under the pressure of it. And even with this cloud, even with this fire, they begin to crumble. What that's a sign of is it's a sign the heart isn't in order. It's a sign that someone or something other than God is at the center of your story. 
It's a sign that you're controlled by the spirit of fear. Because God has spoken and God has made it clear and God has made it obvious. But never mind what the word of God has said, the authority of our life. Fear grips us and controls us. It's to the point that even with this obvious sign of God's leading, like Israel's about to turn completely on Moses. So what do we do when our fear grips us to that degree? You know, I have to think about this in our story here with the point and when we were praying for a facility, when it came down to the, to the last hour, I'll never forget this feeling of, okay, God, like you've led us here to Charlottesville. We've developed this core group. We've built this team. We've sold everything that we've owned so that we could move here and be a part of this. And God, thanks. Thanks a lot for leading us here just so that we can fail. God, thank you, because like all we've done, like this is, this is how you treat those that are faithful to you. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. We were feeling that. I was feeling that. And I didn't tell the team that. I didn't tell the church that at the time, but I've got to be honest. Lord, you've led us here to Charlottesville, an hour north of Lynchburg, so that we can fail and so that everybody can see it. Thanks, Lord. That's the nature of the spirit of fear when it grips us and when it overwhelms the voice of God's leading in our lives. Do you see why it's so important that we allow the word of God to be the authority over our hearts and our minds? Because when we don't and we're not in the word and when we're not using the word as a filter for life's experiences and when he's not at the center of the story, I mean, we begin to turn. We turn on ourselves. We turn on people. We point fingers. We have a spirit of criticism. We have a spirit of, of fear and we have a spirit of just all these spirits that just begin to overwhelm us. They're not of God. It's not the voice of God. God has given you a spirit of, of, of love and of power and of sound mind. That's what God wants for your life. That's what's available to us. But it's very easy when the Egyptian army's coming after us to feel like that God has abandoned us in the uncertainty. So what, what do we do? Look with me at verse 13. I love this. So Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by. And see the salvation of the Lord, which by the way, salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua, which translates to the Greek name Jesus in the New Testament. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, look at this, pay attention to this, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. So how's this for a strategy in your uncertainty? If you're in an uncertain place right now, you just stand by and keep quiet. You just stand by and stay calm. And then according to verse number 14, here's the promise. God says, I will fight for you. I wonder in our uncertainty right now, how many of us are carrying a weight and a burden that God never intended for us to carry? Like you read that in verse 14, like the Lord will fight for you. You say, that sounds good. Yeah, right. I've got to carry this burden. I've got to live in the uncertainty. I've got to be at the center of this story. How many of us this morning are fighting a battle that God never intended for us to fight? How many of us are carrying a burden that God never intended for you to carry? You know what the enemy wants you to believe? The enemy wants you to believe the responsibilities on you. You know what God is saying? You stay calm, you rest in me, and you let me fight the battle for you. I think about times when life gets the heaviest for me, and I have to wonder how much of that is just simply because I'm taking this responsibility that God is saying is mine upon myself. I have to um, share with you this story in, in The Circle Maker which is a book by Mark Batterson in one of my favorite books of all time. He tells the story himself and, and you know, it's kind of a thing in the pastoral wor world of like, you hear stories of, of pastors and facilities and like God shuts the door and they've got a week to move out and find something new. I mean, it's just kind of the world that, that I live in, this fear of that and, um, and that other pastors have shared stories about. 
Well, he tells the story of his church, National Community Church, where they're actually in that position that they, they learned that they have a week to get out to vacate this facility that they're in, which in itself it was, seemed like a God thing at the time. And how he goes to a conference and he hears someone speak on these verses from Exodus 14, 13 through 14. And, and this is the question that he asked. Listen to this. What would be the hardest thing to do with the Egyptian army charging straight at you full speed? Think about it. What's the hardest thing to do in this moment? The hardest thing to do is precisely what God told them to do, to just stand still. God doesn't just play chicken. He also plays flinch. When we find ourselves in this kind of a situation, we want to do something, anything. We have this nervous energy that wants to solve the problem as quickly as possible. But God tells them to do nothing but pray. Have you tried that yet? I mean, really, have you tried that? Have you battled through it and really given it over? The Bible says, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. God's not out to get you. God is in love with you. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. You know what the enemy wants to do is he wants to undermine the heart of God for you in your life. He wants to tell you that God is out to get you. God is not out to get you. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. Listen to me. God is for you. God is for you. He wants so much for your life. He wants so much for your life beyond what you could ever imagine for yourself. God has so much for you. He loves you beyond anything you could ever imagine. But the enemy would love to call that into question. He does that, doesn't he? But listen to what he says. God tells them to do nothing but pray. So the closer the Egyptian army got, the more intense their prayers became. They clenched their jaws, they stood their holy ground, and they prayed like they had never prayed before. I think about that week and a half leading up to the day that we were starting the church, not knowing where it was going to be. Do you think that I was on my face before God? Because I can recall that season very, very, very real in my mind, how overwhelmed I was. And it was in a position where I was literally praying, God, if you don't come through, it's not going to happen. And if I were the center of the story, that doesn't make sense because I don't like that. But because God is the center of the story, God said it's going to happen in my timing. And when it does happen, there's only one that's going to get the glory for it. Are you with me? Have we prayed through it? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I've been there the past couple of days as I've personally been wrestling through some fears. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. If you go back and you kind of write those verses down, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and you go back and compare them to the verses that we just read, Exodus 4, 13 through 14, I mean, the parallels are just amazing of what the Israelites were told to do in Exodus and what Paul tells us to do in Philippians. So what we're going to do for the sake of time, and, and I would encourage you, you could pick up the story in verse number 21 and actually read through it this week. You could study it this week. It's an amazing uh, st study uh, in your morning quiet time that we're all going to have this week. Amen? And in verse 27, though, we're going to drop down to verse 27. God had given them instruction. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And, then, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned and they covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. Write that down. Not even one of them remained or underline it. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. Verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel, look at this, underline these words, saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. 
Verse 31, and when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. You know, everybody who reads this story, you think the same thing. Okay, only God could do what, what he did. Only God could do this. We get that. But I said there's a second part to this point, that God will use obstacles and uncertainties to to show off for his glory, but I also said what? For our what? For our what? For our good. Let's read it together. God uses obstacles of uncertainty as opportunities to show off for his glory and for our good. Now, here's what you need to understand. His glory and our good go hand in hand. You say, Pastor, like, I want to be married one day. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get married. Listen, I, I promise you, his glory and our good go hand in hand, okay? I'm not sure how my financial world is going to work out. I can promise you, his glory and for our good go hand in hand. Regardless of the uncertainty, it's all going to come together for his glory and, and for our good. So what does this look like for our good? Well, if you look with me for just a moment back at verse number 10, notice the transformation that happens in the hearts of the Israelites. Verse 10, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became very frightened. Say that with me. And they became very frightened so that the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. But you notice throughout the story as God shows off the transformation that happens. Look at verse number 13 for just a moment. I'm going to throw our folks on Pro Presenter a little curveball, but look at verse 13 for just a moment. Look at what God says at the, here in this verse. But Moses said to the people, rather, Moses, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, look at what he says, you will never see them again forever. Say that out loud. You will never see them again forever. In fact, then if you look down to verse number 30, which we just read, We saw this on verse number 30, the very end. They saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Say that with me. Saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Then if you look down at verse 31, one more time. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. Say that with me. The people feared the Lord. Do you see the transformation that happens in Israel? They went from being focused on their fears, on their uncertainty, to being focused on God. And this incredible heart transformation takes place in this process. So yes, God shows up and shows off in a great way for his glory but a big part of for his glory is the work that God wants to accomplish in our hearts as well. And while again, I could say any number of things to comfort you right now in your uncertainty and none of them would be emotionally gratifying or satisfying to you, I can tell you this, that God is doing a work in your heart in the midst of the uncertainty. And what you will find is God leads you through the uncertainty just as he did with the Israelites. Sure, you could have gotten to the desert and you could have kept going forward and you could have escaped the Egyptians. But do you know what God God wants to do right now with your uncertainty? He wants to lay it for, to, to rest once and for all. And I'm going to tell you something. If God hadn't led Israel as he did, and if he hadn't killed them all in the midst of the Red Sea as it came crashing down upon them, and if the Israelites hadn't seen these bodies wash up on the shore after the fact, they, they would have always been wondering about the uncertainty that would have continued to linger. Let me tell you what God wants to do with your uncertainty. God wants to lay it to rest once and for all. He doesn't want you to continually be controlled by fear, gripped by fear, gripped by worry, gripped by the anxiety. He wants to lay it to rest. He wants to settle the issue in your heart once and for all that he's big enough. I love what my mentor says. How big is God? He's big enough. How big is God? He's big enough. And what I've learned through that season of uncertainty regarding the facility 
is a God of sufficient. His grace is sufficient, and he is big enough. And even in the process, even in the in-between, he does a work in your heart that when you get through it and you look back on, you will thank God for what he's accomplished in and through you, for the work that he's done in you. Philippians 2, Paul says it like this, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God wants to work out what he's worked in you. And he has you in that process right now, in this season right now, for a very important reason. We've got to remember that because he's at the center of this story. The last thing I want to say this morning as we get ready to close is that ultimately what we see happening here in the Old Testament is a picture of what Jesus is going to do for us in the new. I mentioned that word in verse number 13, salvation. It's the Hebrew word Yeshua, which translates to the name Jesus in the New Testament. God is salvation. And I want you to know this morning that maybe the uncertainty that you're facing is an uncertainty of, of your future and of eternity and where it is that you would spend eternity. I remember before I trusted Jesus, that was a very real fear in my heart. If I were to die and leave this world right now, like where would I go? Heaven? Hell? Where? And I want you to know that apart from Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There is no eternal life. And one of the greatest uncertainties that you can lay to rest today is the uncertainty of where you would spend eternity if you were to leave this world. We read this story. I believe that's the picture and the reminder that God wants for you today is that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And today he wants you to trust him for that as Lord and Savior. And so as we're going to close in just a minute, I'm going to give you that opportunity to make a decision to trust Jesus today. But then I have to believe as well, there's a lot of believers that are here, that that uncertainty that you wrote down initially, that you identified initially, it's pretty heavy. And it could crush you. You feel as if it could. What would it look like today for us to lay this down, to lay it down? You know, for me, it's this uncertainty of like, this is a great facility, but I also know it's not long-term. A question a lot of you ask is, well, where's the permanent facility going to be? I don't know. And that tends to weigh on me at times. And I have found myself, because we love this place, and it's awesome and amazing, and um, we have a great relationship. Like, we're not getting kicked out next week that I know of. But I'm not going to lie. It does weigh on me. And that's something I've been battling with and wrestling through. And I have to go back to this truth that God uses our uncertainties for his glory and our good and rest in that. But what is it that you need to rest in this morning? We're going to have a final song in just a minute. And I just want to encourage you, maybe today you need to come and you need to bow your heart on this altar. And I mean really pray and give it over to him. What's God calling you to do? Let's right now bow our hearts and minds together. Jesus, thank you. For this time you've given us this morning, your word, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that nothing in the world has the power that your word has. And God, I want to pray right now for those that are here that have never trusted you as Lord and Savior. The most important decision they will ever make with their life is to place their faith and trust in you. And they have an uncertainty regarding eternity. Today you can settle that, Lord. God, give us the grace and strength to hear from you and to make this decision to trust you for salvation. It says about and eyes are closed. Everybody's still in quiet. If you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior today, you want to make that decision. I want to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. I place my faith in you today for salvation. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. Give me the strength to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.